Going dry this January? Make it Elias, the official spirit of Dry January. Hey, all you songbirds out there. Thank you so much for joining us here at Tail Feather Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Crutchfield. I have the one and the only Amy Schmidt with me. Uh, I'm going to let the audience know fully and clearly that Amy and I have known each other for a number of years. We worked together in a corporate uh, company years ago, and she she worked for one of my favorite brands in the world, which made working for that brand delightful. Uh, I don't want to steal any of your thunder, though, Amy. Please tell the audience who you are. Hey, y'all. Hey, Nick. It's awesome to see you tonight, and I'm hoping that one day pretty soon we'll be able to have a beverage together in the same room, uh, possibly a liar. So that would be lovely. Uh, a bit yeah. about my, my background is, yeah, I got started many moons ago in the music industry, spent some time over at a creative agency, and then decided to jump right into Brand World and worked for Diageo for about eight years. That's where we met, by the way. Um, and my love for plants and all things herbal uh, brought me over to the cannabis side of the greener side of the house. And now yeah. today, it's uh, 2024. I'm very proud to say that I've uh, left the corporate world, still work with the corporate world, but I started my own marketing consulting firm uh, and working with a lot of amazing, amazing brands. So very happy to be here today and hopefully to share some stories um, of some of the lessons I've learned along the way, maybe more what to avoid and all the mistakes I've made, but um, very happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for being on. And um, I had no idea about your, your music background. I come from the live music industry as well, just adjacent to it. So I ran concert venues, uh, bars at concert venues, around the Mid-Atlantic and worked for the number one concert venue uh, in the U.S. for about, I think it was number one for like five years running, according to Rolling Stone magazine. And that was, that was a different style of Rolling Stone back in the day. Uh, but Amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I think you're like the second guest inside of five episodes that has worked in the music industry. That's, that's pretty yeah. fun. Um, yes, for, for it, I would say, building on music, and I think this very, um, was really relevant, especially working in the mm -hmm. beverage space because of how social beverages are and how beverage, it brings people together for conversation and occasion, and music is very similar in that way, and so I think that there's um, a lot of opportunity to learn from the artists and the musicians and how you might market your brand and connect with your, your audience, so. Uh, definitely, that's a, that's a I didn't really know it at the point. time, but it really built a foundation yeah. for um, strong, strong ways to consider reaching your consumers through through music and other cultural touch points. Yeah. That's a that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about looking at looking at it through that lens. I believe heavily in the power of the great equalizers, and the great equalizers being uh, phenomenon, cultural phenomenon inside of societies where you don't have to share a common language to enjoy something together in a mm -hmm. communal experience. So music, art, sports, so forth, and pubs, bars, they're the concierge desk and ambassadors of every city, right? Um, but you did mention brands there and, and how to tell a story uh, to the c consumer base, to the people that are going to be enjoying products. Um, so inside of the first steps of a brand, right? You've got to build the brand. You got to get your MVP out, your minimal viable product. You got to do testing, so forth. Once the brand is built and then somebody like yourself gets hired to bring it into the market, what are your first steps when choosing the audience and how are you going to sell it to them? Because people are going to want to know how to approach the market more completely once they've got that minimal viable product, minimal viable product. Uh, has been established <laughs> and the brand is built. Yeah. So in your building stages, uh, to answer your question, I want to set the stage, right? So mm -hmm. as you're building and creating your product, the, the first, some of the first early stages is understanding what is that consumer need that you're meeting? What is the problem or the pain point that you're solving for your consumer mm -hmm. audience? So you're really clear on what you're going to offer as a brand. So having that together and really tight is imperative 
because it, it sets you up for the next phase is what you're asking about is your route to market. And I know we don't have all yeah. night, so I wanted to maybe pick two or three ideas yeah. and areas that I like to guide my clients for, for consideration. And, and, and really, um, I could probably go on about it for, for a while, but I would say the first, the first thing is you have your product, you know who your target consumer is, but go deeper. Mm -hmm. Spend a day virtually or physically walking in their life, right? Where they like to eat. Where do they like to shop? Are they going to Target? Are they always going to Amazon? Or are they the type of person that only shops at local small boutique stores, right? Um, mm -hmm. When they're consuming media, where do they go? Do they like to watch Netflix? Are they reading blogs? Are they listening to podcasts? Like all of these um, inputs, if you will, a day in the life will show you exactly who where, what they're doing, and it gives you a really good sense of where your brand messaging might resonate, might be um, welcomed into that part of their daily life, right? So having that understanding right. is just a really incredible asset to go faster, deeper, right away with the audience that you're intending to attract. Right, so that's happening. And then Okay, yeah. you know your consumer audience. Uh, it's important. What's your distribution plan, right? Map it out. Um, if you're yeah. in our world, right, beverages, that's the on-premise, your off-premise, and also DTC. So really make sure you know where your consumers can buy your product. So before you put any marketing spend or programming and brand awareness, you got to be able to buy the product. You want to realize, you want to get um, a good ROI for all of your efforts, and it starts with that distribution foundation. So that's also a very important thing to look at the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, thirdly, when, when you do have your distribution, when you do have uh, a really good understanding of your consumer audience, in my world, I think it's really fun to go deeper with your partners, right? Who are those um, brand, other brand partners across that universe? Remember, you mapped out where your consumer shops, what other brands that they love. Who might be fun to pair up with and to do some programming and marketing together? Because if you really break it down, you know, if your friend recommends a product or an event to go to, you're more likely, you trust them, you're more likely to do it than seeing mm -hmm an advertisement on TV or, you know, coming across your podcast, et cetera. Um, although those are great for brand awareness, but to me, yeah. the future of marketing is through these relevant strategic cultural partnerships. Um, an example mm -hmm. could be if you're a brand that really wants to reach the wellness women, people that are very mindful of what they're putting in their bodies, they want to consume our plants, mm -hmm then potentially it could be fun to partner with um, a national yoga studio across the country and have a post-yoga sampling program, right? I'm just making this up. It can be, you know, everything from I like it. cowboys and, and rodeos, <laughs> yeah, to, to yeah. yoga studios. But you know your consumer and you know what other brands and just reach out because a lot of times it's not – going to take a lot of funds to get the partnership off the ground. It's just creativity to decide how can y'all work together to really um, impact and delight their audiences and recruit their audience into your world. So those are a couple of ways in that I like to think about as you explore your route to market and begin to build build your presence. Right on. Um, I think the awareness point that you brought up is pretty important in, in finding those right partners, um, whether or not that's Crown Royal in the rodeos or athletic in their guerrilla marketing in the early days and showing up at marathons with cases of beer or with liars doing a partnership with the ACS, the American Cancer Society next month. I mean, well, actually it would be this month because this is when it's airing. Um, so I think finding those cultural, culturally significant partners that do make sense to the brand identity and in turn 
relay that brand identity and awareness into a consumer in a more culturally appropriate manner, I think is, uh, honestly, you've hit the nail on the head. It's the future of marketing. It's making something relevant that already is relevant. You just have to get the messaging across. Um, so when you're looking at the steps that you just talked about, um, what are some changes for those people? Because again, this is about startups. Uh, this, yeah, I could even look at liars historically and look at our growth pattern over the past six years, uh, four years since 2019, but six since the inception of the idea. Actually, eight now that we're in 2024. I cannot get 2024 into my head, <laughs> and we're a month into or half a month into this. Welcome. Um, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> What are some some changes that brand launchers can expect that you being that marketing consult uh, are are going to to grab that proverbial bull by the horns and and wrestle it? Yeah. Oof. You know, if I had. I love astrology, um, and if I had a crystal mm -hmm. ball, I could help everyone with the exact issues that they're going to have as they look to start and scale their business, but um, I don't have all that, mm -hmm. so I think here's how I like to, to frame it up. Um, for me, and the way I work, is put your dream out there. What is your vision? What is the impact that you want your brand to have? What is that goal that you're trying to achieve and, and by when, right? So have that really clear, mm. so clear in your mind and then let go of the how, right? Because as you have that goal, you know where you're going and maybe you do plot a relatively linear path to get from A to success, but mm -hmm. there's going to be twists and turns along the way. And that's a fact. And so when you are already prepared for, for the unknown, because most of the issues that pop up, in my experience, have been the bucket of what we don't know yet, right? They pop yeah, up, yeah. and then you pull your team together, and you make decisions, and you solve, and you navigate. And having that clear path for where you're going and an understanding that, well, it's going to get bumpy but I know I'm on the right path and I know where I want to get. So I'm not going to worry about how am I going to get there? I just know where I'm going. So I would take yeah. that as step one. And then as you're navigating that, of course, you're going to have compromises that are going to come up. And what has really helped me and I help guide my clients is two things. The first one is really get, very clear on the roles and responsibilities of your team, right? If mm -hmm. you, even, even a smallest team, if everyone knows exactly how their work, their effort impacts and supports and achieves the greater goal that y'all are all sharing mm -hmm. and all working towards, then they feel empowered and they're motivated, right? And with clear roles and responsibilities, you can be very efficient with decision making. So there's going to be the bump. You need to make some decisions and having a leader and clear outline of who makes what decisions helps you stay on pace and get there and where you need to go. Otherwise, you can do a lot of circling. And the second thing I like to share to help through the compromises, if you will, you have to know your values. What does your brand stand for? What is the strongest values? that you've built for your brand and knowing that at your core from how you communicate externally to your audiences to how you operate internally, it's a game changer. It helps make decisions. Mm -hmm. They're still going to be hard, but you know what you cannot compromise on and what's a nice to have. So, you know, potentially sustainability is a really important part of your brand. So you're always going mm -hmm. to make the best decisions for the business that have the lightest impact on your supply chain. And you're going to be transparent with your internal team and your, your audience on the choices that you're having to make. So those two elements, you know, I can't, I can't take out the difficulties and the challenges that come up. That's maybe the fun part, the opportunities, if we want yeah. to reframe it. But yeah. having those two elements and an understanding of, yeah, this is how the process is going to go. 
can, it helps me and it, I, it, it feels like it helps my clients and the brands that I've had the privilege to work with have a better attitude and stay on that course for sure. Right on. You brought up a lot of really good points there, and I, I think I'm going to highlight quite a few of them. There's always a bonus episode between the episodes, and um, I'm going to definitely highlight something inside of those. There's two or three things that I marked that um, really just spoke to me, and, and one of those things is deadlines. I don't think people set deadlines correctly, maybe. I think they have this deadline of of I want to get this stuff done by X, Y, and Z, but they don't take into consideration that wiggle room. Um, restaurants are infamous for this. I've I've opened mm -hmm. up well over a dozen restaurants and bars across the mid-Atlantic, and every single owner that I've opened up for, with the exception of one, had an unrealistic launch date and an unrealistic budget attached to the launch of the restaurant. And it's it's infuriating at times, but again, being a project leader, you you take it, you find ways to work with it. And in that dead space, you build a better and more solid team. Like time is, is we both know time is the only real currency and you got to be able to do the best that you can with what you're given. Uh, I do want to take uh, something you just said and ask you a, a build on question there. Okay. Um, you have vision, you've got this wiggle room, you don't know what you don't know, but you get it into the known and then you make it known and you make it, uh, we'll say a priority inside of the brand, right? Uh, so let's say you have an established brand and then you're doing uh, an innovation uh, of the brand. You're doing a second label or maybe a third or fourth. And all the test markets said it was viable. Your your test, uh, your, your uh, marketing group said that it made sense and that they liked it. It'll sell to X, Y, and Z markets with X, Y, and Z consumer. What do you do when that information, I'm going to give you a two-part question. What do you do with that information when it's correct and it, it launches and it doesn't work? And what do you do with that information if it launched and it was suggested that it doesn't launch, but it launches anyway and it doesn't work? I, th I think I know the answers to these questions, and this is not a historical thing uh, that either of us may or may not have worked on. It's just a an example of things that I see brands do honestly pretty often, like some of the innovation I see, I'm like, did, did that really go through a, a, a research group? Like, how did that happen? So I'm just trying to think about when a brand is, cause there's a lot of brands that will, okay, I'm going to do this right now and I want to launch and I'm going to be a new brand this year. And within 12 months, I want to do an innovation launch. That might not be the, the smartest route. Right. So that's the kind of example I'm trying to, to drum up here. Yeah. Okay. No namey name. Let me, this is a two part answer for me. The first part is okay. fail fast, right? If it gets into the market and the product, you know, the product is not getting the reviews that you had hoped with the target audience, um, mm -hmm. you know, a variety of outside input might mean that this product is not meant, meant to be. Okay, fail fast, yeah. get out, right? That's option. That could be an option. Another yeah. way to think about, and it's not really, it's not just related to new to world brands. I would say even established legacy brands have gotten in a rut or they're consumer audience has moved on to something else or they've aged out and they've had to really think about reinventing themselves. So let's just say mm. you have a fabulous, you know, if it's a beverage, again, a fabulous liquid, a great offering, the packaging is gorgeous. They didn't resonate right off the bat with the intended consumer audience. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how might you, and we're going to assume here that the consumer audience is the right audience because that's all the studies, all the needs are being met for this audience. How might right. you consider taking a, taking on a partner or another way to introduce the brand to this audience? Um, all right, I'm going to share an example. There is mm -hmm. various established Irish beer brand, right? And, you mm -hmm. know, St. Patrick's Day in the U.S., that's the top-selling period. 
in the bars for Irish beverages. And this mm-hmm. brand is a couple, you know, over a hundred years old and they needed to have top of mind awareness. They need to really reinvigorate this brand with a younger 25 plus audience. So instead of leaning into shamrocks and pots of gold and traditional, you know, stereotypical um, Irishness, nothing wrong with leaning into that. Um, They decided, Mm -hmm. how do we meet our consumer where they are and let's partner with Airbnb, right? And so for this particular selling period, I'll share the headline, they grew double digits in the on-premise growth because they worked with Airbnb, they partnered up to host a night at their brewery in Ireland. And with this really fun opportunity, it gave all of the media an opportunity to talk about something fun, something modern, something accessible for St. Patrick's Day. So going back to your question, it's not working, it's failed. Assuming you're not gonna fail fast, how do you take a step back and think about what is the message and how can I share this message through other partners to reach that intended consumer and, and rethink it. So that's, that's like off the, off the top. I'm sure I can come up with a, mm-hmm. a few, a few other ways, but you know, you don't always hit it out of the park, so to speak on your, on your first launch. And so I think having that growth mindset and knowing mm-hmm. having a strong leadership team to know when something's not working and on the flip side, when you need to give it a little bit more time or, and, or um, invite the right partners to reach your consumer. Right on. Those are, man, what, what a set of answers. That's amazing. And you just spoke about time and this is about that time that I'm going to have to take a break. So this uh, folks, ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to tail feather powered by liars, not alcoholic. I'm Nick Crutchfield, your host. She is Amy Schmidt, our guest. Uh, We are going to be back in just a few minutes after this message from our sponsor for the entire first season of Tail Feather, Liars Non-Alcoholic. See you in just a The Liars Non-Alcoholic Pink Spritz. I taste the world through rose-colored glasses. Delicious. Stay spirited. Make it a liar's. Hey, welcome back, folks. Hope you enjoyed that little commercial from our friends over at Liars Non-Alcoholic. I love a pink spritz. a matter of fact, as soon as I get back to the States, I'm going to have one. I have a bottle of our pink London sitting on my in-laws counter. I have a four pack of Navy Hill tonic local to Richmond, Virginia, uh, sitting in the fridge, unless my father-in-law gets into it, which is highly possible uh, that I'm going to break into. And I can't wait for that. Uh, but let's get back to our conversation with Amy Schmidt here today. Uh, when we're going to go into the brand side of things and and how they interact with pubs, restaurants, groups, the on trade, uh, the off trade, uh, we should probably touch on that. I think a little bit. Um, I think the off trade for those of you listening, on trade inside of the U.S. is going to be uh, bars, restaurants, pubs, cafes, uh, concert venues, anything that sells at, at retail but to can be consumed on the spot, essentially where off trade means you're taking it home. So retail stores, big box stores, uh, boutique grocery stores, anything where you're not consuming on the premises of the, uh, the brick and mortar. Right. And then DTC means direct to consumer, which is e-com, which is buying off of a website and it comes to your front door. All right. So having said all of that, uh, when you see brands interact with uh, bars, restaurants, the on trade, um, what do you think can be adjusted to how the the new way that the world is working? I think since the age of search engines and instant information, we're, we're a little impatient with how things work. I think we might hurry things up a little too much and we all think that COVID's over, but it's still kind of in this weird endemic phase, the end of the pandemic, beginning of an endemic uh, and we're seeing that in some of the data at this point, 30% decrease in foot traffic year over year inside of bars and restaurants inside of the U.S. That's data from about 10 days ago. That's an insane number when you think about it. And when you think about a restaurant or a bar operating in about a three and a half, four percent profit model, um, that's that's a, that's, you know, giving up 30% of 4% is a big number. And then when you look at the 
decrease in ordering, which is 27% less drinks are going across bars at this point. Um, not out low ABV, traditional drinks, there's going to be some adjustments made, right? How do brands, i.e. suppliers, help with the on-trade, and especially from the marketing angle and programming? That's that. Um, yeah, it's that's a hard tough. one. Um, it's tough. I think, first off, uh, I like to think the tide rises all boats. And so think mm -hmm. of the on trade, your partners, the bar owners, the managers, the bar teams serving uh, the beverages to the guests. Think of them as your, your partners and come to your visits and your communications with an open mind and listen, right? And be a co-conspirator in the health of their business, right? Their business mm -hmm. is struggling right now it's imperative that you as a supplier um, is able to be a good partner. So coming from that place, knowing that um, it's competitive as hell, right? So yeah, it is. that said, yeah. once you are ready and you're building the relationship and you're listening to what they want and need and some considerations for how they see their business growing, then you're able to um, form that relationship and explore, hey, we'll just take a non-elf beverage, for example. I see that you mm -hmm. have, um, you're selling sparkling water. I have a beautiful product. Here's some top popular uh, cocktails right now that are really selling and consumers are asking for them. So why don't you put this on your menu? You're gonna make a better margin than on that bottle of water, right? Just just as an example. So yeah. you're two parts. You're putting yourself, getting on the menu because it's competitive, people are drinking less. Being on the menu gives you the best opportunity for volume and pull through, but also at the mm -hmm. same time, you're showing your partner how they're gonna make more money, how they're going to increase the value of the customer coming in, potentially the one that's you know, choosing not to drink for that evening for whatever, for whatever reason. So I think being right. um, a listener and then reviewing what they currently have on offer and how can you help them succeed better? So that's, that's part one. And, you know, the second part for me, is just my, my heart is always rooted in ed education, right? How can you yeah. help and center your brand into education and furthering the career path of the bartender behind the bar. You know, um, there's so many just incredible individuals that want to learn and want to know more about where, um, you know, where your product comes from or where that product or just um, industry knowledge overall. And so setting yourself mm -hmm. up and having a brand ambassador or really creating very um, beautiful, educational, succinct sell sheets to help educate um, is, is really crucial. So those are a couple of ways to, to build that relationship. But again, it goes mm -hmm. back to understanding the position that many of these bars, restaurants, cafes, music venues are in because they're not seeing the same foot traffic as they did you know, a couple, a couple of years ago. Yeah, I, I really like that you put in there partnership and education. Uh, the partnership especially I'm going to touch on first because uh, partnership does not mean that I'm coming in with my credit card, swiping it, saying hi, and leaving. That is not partnership. That is uh, buying into a system, right? So true partnership means exactly what you said in that second part is education, showing up, being present, saying hello. Um giving solutions to problems that people just simply don't have the bandwidth to get behind right now. Like, I don't know how many operators I've talked to that are just worn to the frazzle right now. And it's, it's largely because they're having to train staff, lean on your suppliers to help train in a way that's not propagandizing. And it's just solely about the brand. Yes, there has to be brand messaging there. That's why we do this stuff. But there also has to be categorical information and 
100% of any, and I'm sure you've seen some of my educational models from the past where you don't just go in about the brand. It needs to be about the category because you can't understand the brand if you don't understand the category. So for those of you that are budding advocacy specialists, people that are writing sales sheets, people that are designing programming that does education, you must touch on the category first. If you don't, you're giving them nothing more than propaganda. And that's not helping the entirety of the situation for your company, for your brand, or for the people that you're trying your best to help. And I think that a lot of us go into this with our best foot forward and our heart in the right place. We get excited. I'm an ambassador. I'm an educator. I'm a uh, specialist, whatever, whatever. I'm a cam, whatever my, my title is at that point. Your title may not say that you're a partner, but that's what you are. You're walking in to help them help themselves to take a, a line from an old movie. Help me help you, right? And the swipe doesn't help anything, but that immediate need. The long-term need isn't being met with just a swipe. And I think that's a really important part to put there. Are people going to do it? Absolutely. That's part of the game. Uh, federally illegal, but people still do it across the board. It, it, it absolutely blows my mind. But uh, it, it's it's a thing. Just for you, for you operators out there that are listening and watching, understand that true long-term partnership means that I'm offering more than just a swipe. I'm offering more than just stock. I'm coming in and helping your business succeed. So seek out those. In the education portion of your answer, I want to expand that a little more. Um, what does good education look like to you these days? Because, you know, people learn in different ways. And the more that we start to understand about the neurodivergent, um, the trauma survivors, the the way that the public's interacting with with our our proverbial kinship across the world. Uh, now, people have different learning styles, right? Some are tactile, some are visual, some are audio, audible, um, sonic, I guess is another word to use. Some are uh, through reading. What What type of educational materials do you think we need to pay more attention to and less attention to? So I think you're spot on in the sense that not everyone takes an inf or prefers to take in information in the same way. And I'll also say mm -hmm. that sometimes um, receiving information in two different modalities helps the information sink in. So my recommendation to brands um, with as much as possible, obviously it takes time to put all of this together, but having short, very um, engaging, pithy video modules, right? Because some people like to, mm. to watch if they're on a break and they, they learn a little bit here and there and you can have badges and things like that to, to get more information. So that's one way. And then you have your, um, in, in the way that I learn is in person, right? Sitting in a group, having an expert come in and not necessarily talk at the group, but en engage yeah. us, right? So if you're selling me a beautiful whiskey, then let's do a whiskey tasting lab and have all the constituents of the components that go into this whiskey and we have some fun with it. So it's a yeah. IRL and have make it experiential, right? And as you're working with your teams or you know, you're making it by yourself, cocktails, whatever the activity is, it can be a, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You're learning and the speaker is able to share information in a way that's, you know, not just talking head. So that's, you know, I always go for that and support that. Yet I know many people do yeah. not like to have participation. So over here, it's important to have those takeaways. So it can be digital, you know, reading links for further study. Um, just something that if you don't want to watch a video with sound, you're really not feeling the in-person, but you're comfortable, you know, maybe you have some downtime and you can look on your phone and read through uh, education on, you know, whatever the topic is at hand. So to answer your yeah. question, you need a lot of modalities. And if you're able to offer a variety of ways in, make them short and sweet mm -hmm. and to the point and educational and fun, um, 
then you will be successful. And I think over time, you'll understand, okay, right, this audience really loves this way and this audience this way. So you, you get to know um, what people like and what people don't like, because remember, you're, you're listening. You're, you're always listening and, yeah. and learning and receiving feedback from, from your partner. Yeah. You brought up being short, sweet, to the point, video, maybe even app-based uh, there uh, in your answer. And I think that the data that we just read, the 30% and 27%, can coincide a little bit with the way that Gen Z experiences the world now. Uh, they did, and I'm not sure who they are. I have a photographic memory, so I can see the graph in my head. Wow. But uh, essentially, yeah, it's, it's a curse and a blessing. Stacy, Stacy's my partner. Uh, she can go, hey, where's my purse? And I can see it behind a jacket on a on a coat rack in a room. It's it's a curse and a blessing because some of those things I don't want to remember, right? Um, her purse, absolutely, I do want to remember. She's my partner. Uh, um, the, the, uh, the point that I'm getting to is that inside that data, I think there's another set of data. And I think it kind of coincides with this Gen Z data that I read, which is, Gen Z prefers to experience the world through their mobile devices more so than going out, being with other people, exploring cinema, going to museums, so forth and so on. And when they do go out into the public, they still see it through the lens of a mo mobile device. Um, I have a feeling, and it's just a feeling, there's no data yet that I can that I can correlate between the two, but I have a feeling those two things coincide a little bit. I think that of that 30%, there's a percentage that's due to that phenomenon and that cultural shift in how people experience the world. So I think that you've hit the nail on the head spot on that multiple modality, um, short and to the point and easy to understand, unlike my answer right now, mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that uh, there's access to it. And also showing up, those, those things of the IRL in real life that's how I learn best. Like I like, like when I get certifications, I just recently got my W set three in spirits. I took the crash course. I went to Madrid, Spain. I sat in a classroom. Thank you very much. It's not an easy course, not as hard as the IBD, the GCD from the IBD, but it's really, really difficult. You have to know your stuff. Pass with merit. Thank goodness. Um, and the, in the real life, and I am going to bring up a name here, Douglas Craigle, might be the best person that I've ever sat through a class with when it comes to whiskey. That man is an angel of a human being to begin with. Yeah. And then yeah. the way that yeah. he relates to people, it's so genuine. It's so amazing. And I think we could all learn something from him by just watching what he does in real life and then understanding who he is as a human. Uh, I just, uh, Doug, I'm plugging you here. You already know you're one of my favorite people. Um, there's a lot of Doug's best best friend Doug's out there, but you're you're the best Doug that I know. No offense to my other friends named Doug, uh, which oddly enough, there's a lot of them. Um, so that brings us to the grill. I'm going to throw you on the grill and fry you up real quick. This is the impromptu question. Uh, thankfully, thankfully, luckily for you, there's only one of you on this episode. Some episodes have two people. There'll be a couple that have three, uh, and this one. Uh, I could see others. I could see their light bulbs going off as I ask this question. So, without naming any brands, uh, unless you want to, uh, that's up to you. What is the project that spoke to you most that you've worked on, and how did it change your career trajectory? Like, I know the brands that I've worked on that are very close to my heart. Liars has me in a different mission, which is I, I can feel it in my DNA. I, I truly believe in changing how the the way that people experience culture through the vehicle of no and low. I feel that in my bones. So what is the project that spoke to you the most in your past and how did it change your career trajectory? Oh, okay. Um, let me gather my thoughts. Okay. I'll, I'll insert some Jeopardy theme music here. <laughs> okay. No, I, 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 I have one. Right. Um, yeah. I don't know if this is a specific project, but I do okay. know that some of your some of your listeners are building their brands, are building their teams, and are really in a position of power. 
and I'll, I'll share why. So working, working in cannabis really opened my eyes um, and gave me an understanding of how might we use our position of power to support and uplift and grow minority businesses. And stay with me here. Um, you know, yeah. you have a budget to produce your brand. If you have a retail shop, you probably have a budget to pay your staff or you have a security team. Um, me as a marketer at the time, you know, I was hiring creative agencies and photographers and influencer talent, like all, all of that landscape, which was under marketing. And understanding that every dollar I spend, if it has the ability to support a minority owned business, that's women owned, that's people of color, that's veteran owned, that's LGBTQIA plus owned. So designated minority owned business, taking the funds that I have power over and just at the minimum, making sure that when there's bidding happening for new work, there's a designated minority owned business in that bunch and having, you know, okay, right. This is, this is a new, not new way to think about my position, but a new, mm -hmm. it's a new mission for me as a business to make sure that this is always in my consideration set. And also I share with my clients to build this into your DNA and it's good for business as well because your consumer audience that you serve is very diverse so it's really important that your internal team is also reflective of this diverse consumer audience um, so it's truly a win-win and it's just a muscle to build into the way you operate so shout out to everyone just starting um, Building this consideration set into all of your business decisions feels incredible and it's life changing for so many small businesses to get their feet on the ground, to get their foundation settled by something that you can do. Yeah, that is such a wonderful answer. Um, you know, the unbiased or the bias, the unconscious bias has us hiring and, and working with people that look and sound and smell like us pretty much. Yeah. And I think it's, it's beyond time for us to be more aware as a community. Um, community means everyone. doesn't mean a subset of people. Um, really, that's such an admirable answer. I'm really glad you decided to be on the show with me. This, that's such <laughs> a great answer. And uh, this is when I want, this is the plugging section, meaning you get to talk about anything you want uh, that you're working on, that you're speaking engagements, new projects, anything that you want the public, the listeners, the viewers to be aware of. This is your time to shine. So what would you like to tell us about? Uh, well, thanks, Nick. This was fun. I had a good time tonight. And uh, for those of y'all that want to connect, you can find me on Instagram. My handle is at flowerhouse underscore nyc i am known to be on linkedin uh, so you can find me there and i would say for the startup the scale up the legacy brands you know you want to have marketing conversations and you want to have some marketing support but you're not yet ready to hire that full-time amazing person that's going to change your life uh come to me i'm a great gap filler I like to have the conversations. I like to help solve those early or big problems that you might have and turn it into opportunities. Um, and I look forward to hearing from y'all. Right on. You would be remiss if you didn't hire Amy, y'all. Uh, she's, her legacy that she's built so far, and you're reading one of my favorite books right now, 4,000 Weeks, and the, 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 thought shift the mind shift is coming i promise uh you're an amazing <laughs> human being and to be able to do any project with you would be uh an absolute blossom of a chance so folks if you are looking for that person please give amy uh, a, a touch um this is where you can find tail feather you can find us on apple spotify google amazon 
everywhere that you get your favorite podcast from, you can listen to us. If you go over to our YouTube channel starting next week, you can watch us. Uh, so without any further ado, I am Nick Crutchfield. Thank you so much to our songbirds for tuning in and listening to what we have to share with you. This is Tail Feather sponsored by Liars Not Alcoholic. That's a wrap. Put a feather in my cap. We are out of here from the nest. Again, Nick Crutchfield, Amy Schmidt. I'll see you in two weeks. Adios, folks. Going dry this January? Make it Elias, the official spirit of dry January.